the chief of army staff general manoj pandey mrs archana pandey mrs jean rodricks and family former chiefs their lady wives soldiers past and present friends ladies and gentlemen well i'm deeply honored and equally humbled to be delivering the inaugural general sf rodricks memorial lecture on his 90th birth anniversary what a wonderful way to celebrate the life and times of a thoroughbred professional a very gifted soldier and as mark just told us a fierce competitor even in the boxing ring he was also known for his acerbic wit and most of his young of the youngsters then like me maintained a healthy distance from him let me tell you one small anecdote i cannot vouch for its authenticity but it did the rounds when i was growing up so general rodricks visits a unit and there is this lineup of officers and as is the norm he starts say from the 2ic and asks them what courses he's done so on and so forth and then he walks up to i think the third or the fourth officer who's 6 feet tall and asks him that what courses have you done he says have you done staff college he says no he says lgsc no so general rodricks says nice and tall and that's about all <laughs> so which rocket or which missile general rodricks would fire one never knew but in later years and now i come to the substantive portion of uh, of my talk i as a youngster saw general rodricks grow up into this astute strategic military mind with a deep understanding of the geopolitics of his times he held forth with great wisdom and eloquence on many of the national security challenges of his era a cataclysmic event like ukraine to use mj akbar's byline a european war with far reaching asian consequences would have i presume excited general rodricks greatly even got him thinking vigorously now i make no pretense of being able to rise to the intellectual caliber of general sunit francis rodricks but let me in all humility attempt to present a few thoughts of my own on the ukraine conflict its impact on geopolitics the character of war the wider arc of war fighting and the evolution of firepower dotted of course with lessons of the indian paradigm if we are watchful and discerning as the chief just told us there is much that we could glean from the reverberations around ukraine to shore up the fault lines in our own statecraft diplomacy and strategic military poise may i add that a lot of good things good stuff is already happening we are already we are all aware of it in the firmament of indian defense but the critique that i offer in the context of ukraine is only to further strengthen and fortify our national security posture and so that we can plug into these very exciting times of what in my view is monumental change i thought i must make that clear so let us begin with a larger frame of geopolitics well it would seem to me that ukraine has intensified the churn in big power politics already pretty stormy by several orders of magnitude look at the new alignments and juxtapositioning in the international order chinese attempts to position the enlarged brics as an alternate to the g7 the conflict has intensified divisions been between the east and the west John L Thornton a noted China watcher tells us and this came to me as a big surprise that out of 175 countries from Latin America Africa West Asia and the Indo Pacific only 5 have committed to sanctions against Russia the rest have either opted otherwise or they simply continue to hedge so we have deep divisions in the international orders trade between the two richest cohorts the us and the european union is 905 billion dollars but trade between china and asia has touched 1 trillion dollars the shifting sands of geoeconomics the biggest suppliers of weapons to a beleaguered russia as we all know are not korea and a beleaguered iran under sanctions the growing chinese leverages on russia could be used to to strain the fidelity of the indo russian relationship at some point in the future isolate russia from india the peace dividend that the world reaped since the end of cold war 1.0 
has not only waned, but since 2014, as Walter Russell Mead tells us, we have made, we may well have made a decisive entry into a pre-war era. The singularity of American hegemony is being questioned like never before. America's unfettered freedom buffeted by its 11 aircraft carriers and 800 military bases to roam the globe is being challenged by regional hegemons. We see Russia in the European theater and China increasingly in the Indo-Pacific. Zones of influence are being delineated with growing assertiveness and being defended with equal zeal. So much so that we do seem to be in the throes of a new Cold War 2.0. Henry Kissinger tells us that we are in the foothills. Noted British historian Neil Ferguson opines that we may be closer to the peak. The, Euro the Ukrainian stalemate seems to suggest that we could be heading for a Korea-like armistice, long war as the chief was, I mean, he was wondering what kind, what, what, how long will these wars be, and they could go on to three, four, five years. Ukraine could well be the first hot war of Cold War 2.0. Likewise, a potential conflagration in Taiwan could assume the gravity of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Many indicators seem to be pointing in that direction. It may go far beyond. We could see the outbreak of the second hot war of Cold War 2.0. In the two island chains of the Western Pacific and the Korean Peninsula, may I point out, look at these growing alliances, China, North Korea, Russia. USA, Japan, South Korea, Philippines. There is fervent military activity to include drills, maneuvers, even deployment of the American nuclear SSB and USS Kentucky of the Korean Peninsula. The Americans are looking for new basing in Philippines, simulation of precision strikes on Taiwan. Just over the last 24 hours, Taiwan's radars have tracked 103 PLAF aircraft, 40 of them straight which which strayed into the adiz or the uh, or, or or crossed the meridian line just two weeks back we had the chinese aircraft carrier shandong doing drills to test the a to ad readiness of the pla from trending events it may also be inferred that amongst the key determinants of the emerging pecking order while economics will remain the mainstay what is perhaps mattering more is the skill and wisdom with which you convert these economic surpluses into various metrics of hard power. The military, of course, a sophisticated, calibrated instrument of force, but also technology leads, tools for economic coercion, and a vibrant military industrial ecosystem of innovation, energy and enterprise, supply chains, so on and so forth. And this, in my view, is the first lesson we must distill from Ukraine. Economic prowess alone is not sufficient. Our ability to convert into these metrics of hard power will determine our place and promise in the world. And unfortunately, such generation of power and speed and scale is what the Chinese Communist Party and the PLA have mastered in myriad ways. To make China the colossus that it is. To drive home this point, allow me to quote the US, the US Under Secretary of R&D and not the Chinese, who says that today, from operational idea to combat inventorization, if the Americans take 17 years, the Chinese take seven. If today, he says, you collapse the US and Chinese navies by 50%, while the Americans will take, the mighty Americans will take 20 years to recreate the navy, the Chinese will take only three. Out of 44 leading military technologies, strategic military technologies and their subsets, in 37, who leads? China and not USA. And this, when America spends $950 billion on defense and China just spends 290. So complacency and criminal neglect have got the USA from what was once a position of overwhelming supremacy to this rather sor sorry pass. We in India need to take hard power far more seriously. We are doing it with Arpanar, Bhatta and defense and so on and so forth, but we need to step up the speed and scale if we are to prevail in the ensuing geostrategic competition. Focus more resolutely on the conversion of these economic leads into diverse metrics of hard power. The next point that I'd like to make from the geopolitics around Ukraine is that given the way the Ukraine conflict is currently trending, Russia does seem to have the edge, there are growing voices that are calling for a realistic audit of the delivery 
of Western militaries, more particularly the American military. The $950 billion American military enterprise has fared rather poorly at underwriting American foreign policy. Which was the last conflict or war apart from Desert Storm which the Americans, in which the Americans have really registered a clear military victory, we must honestly ask. Not Vietnam, not Laos, not Kampuchea, not Iraq, not Afghanistan, not even Ukraine. These questions are being raised. So readiness and battlefield delivery remain a humongous challenge, one that must be thoughtfully and continually resourced. As Ukraine threatens to prolong, even expand into a larger Russia-NATO confrontation, it needs to be noted that while in aggregate terms the West has done very well, I mean the Americans alone have given $100 billion in aid, as it has happened so often in the past, many of its critical pieces, that of the West, have begun to wilt and waver. Rishi Sunak said that UK will spend 3% of its GDP on defence. Just two weeks back, he says that we will raise our defence spending to 2.5% of GDP when the state of the economy so allows. For all the noises that Chancellor Scholz made in Germany, their defence expenditure in 2023 is lesser than what it was in 2022. Many credible reports suggest that the mighty Americans, in reviewing their preparations for a full-fledged high-intensity conflict in Taiwan, realize that they do not have seven days of munitions and missiles for a prolonged fight. These are the mighty Americans. So in our unfolding contest with China, what I would like to urge is that we carry out a very comprehensive review of our deterrence and our war fighting postures to include joint exercises to determine our readiness. I think, in my very humble view, the era of single service exercises is over. So readiness and battlefield delivery is something that we must revisit. Such war readiness and upgrades in battlefield deliverance that I advocate may not be a function of budgets alone. I just pointed out $950 billion and $290 billion. So it is possible to strengthen one's strategic military posture, add military muscle without spiraling costs. There is a very prominent report doing the circles from The Economist which says that China used to spend 2.5% of its GDP on defense in 1995. And despite all the modernization that it has done, its expenditure has fallen to 1.7%. So there are smart ways of adding military muscle, as I said, without spiraling costs. Now, this, of course, needs to be investigated in depth because of all the clever things that China does. But perhaps there could be a lesson there. Now, the point that I wish to make is that India has had the luxury of a long warning time. We are seeing how geopolitics is becoming strident. We must take note of Walter Mead, what Walter Mead said that in 2014, the world has moved into this pre-war era. The events of Ukraine accumulating adversity in Taiwan. We are seeing how hard power instruments of force are becoming more and more central to the strategic calculus of nations. And we therefore need to step up our game in terms of speed, momentum, and scale, in terms of creating these currencies of hard power, power radiating deterrence, and war readiness. The character of war. With regard to the nature and character of war, in my view, Ukraine has simply reinforced the age-old truism. While the nature of war is indeed constant and unchanging, the character keeps transforming. In Ukraine, it has done so dramatically. More than a year into the fight, that seems to be the sobering conclusion. So look at these squadron and company battles. They continue to be the mainstay of combat. Tactical skills and the basics of fire and maneuver, valor, honor, grit, resolve, character and leadership will be evergreen in the salience. Look at the current counteroffensive of that has, was launched by Ukraine in June. It is the first modern war which is being launched, a counteroffensive of this scale is being launched without the cover of air power. A hats off to the Ukrainians. But look at the consequences, bloody assaults. The Ukrainians have lost 400,000 soldiers from since when the conflict began till date. The Russians have lost 2,000 tanks, 44 regiments worth, 5,000 artillery pieces. You know, this whole breaching of m complex minefields, I'm told there are five minefields laid in two square meters. 
You have these groups of sappers crawling on their bulb bellies, clearing minefields by hand, under artillery fire, drone strikes, communications being jammed. And in three months, all that the Ukrainians have managed to do is to get some 30 square kilometers. In strategic terms, the stalemate continues. There is no visible change in the front line. And despite some marginal successes in Bakhmut and Robitain, there is no clear breakthrough through the Surukovin line. So the nature of war is unchanged. The wise way forward, therefore, will be to reinforce the traditional attributes in the nature of war while responding with agility, speed, and scale to the enormous changes in the character of war. It is my view that while the Indian Army is pretty okay in the domain of nature of war, it is in our response to the character of war, uh, I think we, we, we could do much more. And the most remarkable of the changes in the character of war is the fact that data is now emerging as a new engine of war. And this is, you know, no futurist talk of science fiction. It's happening every day on the battlefield. I'll give you with examples. So data-driven capacities in fire and maneuver are taking the speed and momentum of warfare to a new high. And if data is the new ammunition, cloud computing is the way to weaponize that ammunition. We have seen in Ukraine that when data is released from a single service silos, when OSINT, NATO, and theater intelligence converge, when data begins talking to data, and when algorithms, coders, and AI are added to the digital mix, Ukraine shows us we can generate exquisite effects in terms of superior decision-making. You're ahead in the OODA loop, persistent safe surveillance, which is once you acquire a target, you retain its custody till you strike. Not these, you know, revisit times of six days, seven days. This will not work. Precision re has been taken to a new high. In Kherson, you had precision weapons striking armor, infantry, bridgeheads, train-based logistics. Also, when you need to do strategic military signaling, I mean, the armies are hitting Kiev, they're hitting Moscow, targeting the mines of Putin and Zelensky. And of course, there is unprecedented lethality, battle-winning factors all. So the digital transformation of the Indian military, its data enablement, in my humble view, must be our foremost priority, and that could be lesson number three from Ukraine. Digital integration today must be a higher priority than structural integration, theater gavans. That's the way the battles have moved. And look at what the Chinese have done. This is once again mind-boggling. The Chinese Communist Party and the PLA has raised an entirely new service, the Strategic Support Force, to dominate the electromagnetic spectrum and drive the data enablement of the PLA, an entirely new service. The Pentagon has sought the services of somebody of the stature and prominence of Eric Skimmet to drive digital transformation of the US military. He has toured 100 military bases, and his cryptic one-line recommendation for the Secretary of Defense is to invest, you're talking of the American military, to invest in software, algorithms, coders, and programmers to upgrade the American military's battlefield poise. We may like to investigate and take note. The other major lesson from Ukraine is one of the massive and multiple cultural transitions. That could be lesson number four from Ukraine. It's very, very surprisingly, the role of new talent pipelines, the private sector, startups, information professionals, even gaming enthusiasts in not only capacity building, but also day-to-day -day combat and war fighting. Look at these events. Look at the HIMARS. They are brought in into Ukraine by the West as these precision platforms, of course, of global quality, and they give you staggering accuracies, play a key role in the recapture of Kherson and Kharkiv, till some Russian gaming enthusiasts learn to fiddle with its GPS. And for a while, and a considerable while, the world's okay. most precise platform is reduced to an inaccurate motto. Survivability. As, a, as autonomous systems as the HIMAR, which could cease fire and upstick from a gun position after a fire assault in seven minutes, I mean, they are finding themselves vulnerable to drone strikes, which come in under four minutes. So survivability, autonomy. And what is driving all this? Innovation, street creativity, and techno technological enterprise which are challenging the fidelity of the world's most sophisticated precision systems. And this is one, just one such account. Social media and other articles are full of tens and hundreds of such accounts. Look at Elon Musk's Starlink terminals. 
this off-grid, high-bandwidth, space-based internet became a potent battle tool. It, was, of course, enabled you know, Zelensky to communicate with global councils, to get, get street resolve growing, to communicate with troops, but it, is, it has been used for data flows, for imagery exchange, for targeting, for persistent surveillance, edge computing, for the operation of drones forms, and even Amazon-based logistics because you have internet available. All this is happening. Now, there is a downside to this. Look at the degree of influence Musk is exercising over the course of the war. Elon Musk, last year, I'm told, Musk blocked Ukrainian access to Starlinks to disrupt a prospective Ukrainian attack on the Russian Navy in Crimea. And when pressed by the administration as to why he had done so, Musk said that he was in a private conversation with some Russians who threatened the use of nuclear weapons, and he did so. I mean, you wonder whether he's CEO of Starlinks or National Security Advisor. But that is the heft of these private sector, uh, of the private sector in startups, because they are delivering on ground. The Marine Corps has taken out its Taylor Talent Management Manual 2030, and it talks of new career pathways. It talks of authorizing two quarters per battalion. It talks of, you know, new... Uh, I was t telling you about those gaming enthusiasts. So when the Americans realized this, they said, why don't we recruit our gaming, gaming enthusiasts? And they were told, you see, all these people had the, these full body tattoos. And full body tattoos were you know, not permissible under recruitment rules. The Americans have been forced to rewrite those recruitment rules. So I'm not saying that the cultural transitions are the end of it all, but it would be, I think, grossly unwise to, to neglect their impact. Peter Thiel's Palantir algorithm. It has integrated intelligence, battlefield management, and targeting to bring in what is called spectrum warfare. So today you have this entire information which is being converted into targeting data through algorithms. So you do it accurately, you do it fa faster, and coders for agile interventions. So these cultural transitions, talent pipelines, new recruitment practices, startups, private sector capacity, something will have to be done about that. As I said, that could be lesson number four. I know it's very difficult in conservative uh, organizations like the military, but something will have to be done. Firepower. When it comes to firepower, Ukraine, in my view, has showcased five distinct trends. The overall evidence seems to be that in attrition battles like Ukraine, and not necessarily in maneuver battles, but in attrition battles like Ukraine, the side with the superior artillery is the most likely to attain operational advantage. Russia seems to be winning because it has a 7 is to 1 advantage in artillery. Accordingly, there is much that is happening in the Indian artillery. The DG artillery has alluded to it. The chief just mentioned um, whatever we are doing in terms of scoot and shoot capacities, ULH, Vajra, so on and so forth. That is wonderful news. The second trend is that in protracted battles, numbers matter. The Ukrainians were once firing 1,10,000 rounds in a week. They had to pull back because the mighty American mil military industrial complex could churn out only one lakh rounds in a month. This has, you know, had implications on delaying the counteroffensive, on fracturing artillery between the two thrusts, Robotine and Bakhmut, and it has had great operational and tactical implications. The shortfalls are so vigorous that no less than President Biden has been scouting foreign capitals for artillery munitions. Many reports suggest that artillery, and these are serious reports, not social media posts, that artillery munitions stockpiles will determine our staying power and therefore the victor in the conflict. U.S. The U.S. helped Pakistan secure an IMF bailout, and this is on intercept.com, I just saw it yesterday, as a quid pro quo for supply of park artillery and other munitions for the Ukrainian conflict. Now, this is what is happening. Putin is making singular entreaties to Kim Jong-un, as we just saw. It was a major agenda item when they met at Vostochony Kospodrom, because the Russians, on an average, are firing 20,000 artillery rounds in a day. Now, I was party to the discussions which said that 40 I at one time was thought to be excessive. That, in actuality, may just be the flaw. We perhaps need to build capacities upwards. So a qualitative and quantitative review of our military industrial capacities, and I think that is the big lesson from Ukraine. Russia is winning because its military industrial capacities seem to be superior than that of the combined West. 
particularly in terms of munitions, I think this is a review that is urgently called, called for. It also is quite evident, and this is trend number three, that firepower is primarily becoming about precision. Else it is of little use. It is certainly of diminishing utility. When I was a youngster, we were told that, you know, as gunners, we don't destroy targets. We merely straddle them. I think that is a metaphor of the past. The central challenge before Indian defense is to transform our ordnance factories, these dumb munition behemoths, through the marriage of microelectronics and explosives into an arsenal of precision. We need perhaps a senior semiconductor mission to cross-link with the larger Indian semiconductor mission that is underway to meet the massive chip semiconductor requirements in defense. Now, I know this is a huge challenge, but one that must be met in mission mode. The massification of precision, so to speak, by lowering of costs through substantial investments in semiconductors. And the big challenge is marrying semiconductors with explosives. The one point here I would like to make, you know, whenever we say that this is not our business, unfortunately, nobody else does it. So wherever we need, you know, military advantages to accrue, there is no option but to get into them and to drive them. Trend number four, the transformational change, and this, in my view, is the most significant of them all, is the emergence of integrated kill chains, a domain which deserves our very close attention. So the leveraging of low-cost and highly capable sensors from handheld devices, microdones, to Starlink's platforms, artillery missiles, loiter munitions, drones, air power, across eight domains, and this is what America is doing, China is doing, eight domains, land, sea, air, subsea, seabed, space, cyber, and those in the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is not theory, this is what the SSF and the rocket force are doing. Software divide defined communication links because they enable moving and sharing of information even when you are not connected to a network. And this is the most challenging part of it all. Well-trained algorithms which sift through mountains of data to identify key pieces of targeting information. AI and improved robotics using edge compute and graphic processes to perform complex tasks, hundreds of trillions of operations in a second. Now, the, the point that I make is what is the difference between kill chains and traditional instruments of firepower, like, say, artillery, even air power? They are, of course, critical. Their utility will never be lost. But their salience, however, will multiply manifold if we grow their attributes as part of these integrated kill chains. The leveraging of sensors, platforms, and technologies across domains, the marriage of drones with artillery, manned aviation with drones, this is all, all this is happening. So it is not artillery, air power growing in silos, but as part of these integrated kill chains. And this is happening in ever-reducing time frames. So the latest metaphor is the ability to generate thousands of kill chains in hundreds of hours. And not organic, organic, inorganic. This will enable the transition from platforms to intelligent networks, from standalone instruments to integrated kill chains. This is something which neither the Americans nor the Chinese have it yet mastered. But the central lesson coming out from Ukraine is this. And most militaries are moving towards it. We need to get into it now. Because if we take a decision now, it will three decades, take nothing less than three decades for this to happen. So we just, I think, need, 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 need to get into this. Look at Russian air power and its relatively underwhelming performance in Ukraine because of its inability or unwillingness to marry into the larger kill chain. This is actually happening. So hybridization of firepower instruments is the future. That is the direction we must do, move towards. And in doing so, we may like to give a serious push to drone capacities and warfare. Now, everybody is talking about it, but just let me highlight a few things. So look what these drones have done. They were originally designed for commercial purposes or for lobbyists, but they have been repurposed brilliantly by the Ukraine for military use. So imaginative use of drones from wingspans of 12 centimeters to 15 meters for recce, for targeting, to hit the financial center in Moscow, flood Ukrainian territory by breaking the Kakova Dam, striking the Angels Air Base as decoys to facilitate the strike on the Russian flagship Moskva. Look how they are being integrated into traditional instruments of air power. Let me quote to you Lieutenant General Kairlo Budanov, the head of the Ukrainian intelligence, who has been instrumental in developing this drone doctrine. He says drones have no fear. You don't feel sorry for them. And so they are being their multiple utilities lie 
in the fact that they are exhausting Russian AD, they are hitting Russian transport planes, bombers, production facilities like in Tive, innovation. By way of penultimate point, and this is the last point I make before I round up, may I stress the urgency of crafting, building a sophisticated system of long-range precision. And I know we are doing something about it, but in my view, that is a halfway house. We need to have this instrument of long-range precision at varying ranges and with the objects of multi-layered deterrence. Let us, in all humility, study the underlying rationale between the storm shadows, the Etakams, and the Taurus from Ukraine. See, by withholding the ATA camps, the Americans have seriously handicapped the counteroffensive. The moment the Ukrainians get these MLRSs with a range of 300 kilometers, they will hit enemy reserves, enemy logistics, reduce reaction capacities. This is exactly what happened in Kherson. And then, say, use of the storm shadow. I mean, were they available in larger numbers? They had launched from the Su-24. They are these used to hit high-value, well-fortified targets, they target Putin's mind, the mind, the political minds of the adversary. So we need this long-range precision system which does all this. And why we must do it, I mean, the driving rationale has to be the Chinese rocket force. It is in a bit of a trouble now, but it has been described by respected American strategic commentators, and please note this, the most formidable enterprise of ballistic cruise and hypersonic systems ever. We must respect or at least investigate it. I'm quoting to you Admiral Paparo, the CNC designator of the IPACOM. This is what he says. He says the DF-21 and DF-26 bases along the Chinese called coastline have altered the principles of naval warfare forever. Look at the political military outcomes. So they are threatening or at least severely eclipsing American force projections into the Western Pacific. They are raising serious questions about America's commitment to treaty allies. I am told in private, Japan and Korea have told the Chinese that unless you hit us, we will not intervene in a Taiwan contingency because they sense the changing balance of power. The Americans are seriously worried. They are carrying out billion-dollar missile defense upgrades in Guam, the Pine Gap, making vigorous attempts to integrate Asia's third patriot, coming up with entirely new concepts of fighting dispersed in yet network, all because of the rocket force and the strategic support force. So we would do well to revisit our approach to long-range precision, missile defense with an entirely fresh, fresh mind. In my view, there are significant vulnerabilities there which need to be plugged. There's also opportunities which could be skillfully exploited. Finally, let me round off with these closing sentences of grand strategic import. And this is primarily in you know, the lessons of Ukraine, but now in the Indo-Chinese context because that seems to be our primary adversary for the next two to three decades. For the first time in history, we have the world's number one and three economies in PPP terms, may soon be in nominal terms too, China and India, growing in close proximity without a natural barrier, the Himalayas having been penetrated by modern communications and without a strategic buffer, there's no Tibet. All said and done, once you go all the analysis that you read, it does seem to me that our geostrategic trajectories are bound to intersect and clash. The surest way of keeping such an intersect peaceful is by strengthening our deterrence by several orders of magnitude. Now, operational ballot rebalancing and all has done a great deal of good. All that is very nice. But given the nature of the Chinese threat, we need to scale up in terms with perhaps with some of the lessons flowing out from Ukraine. China, in my view, believes strongly in the value of hard power. Deception lies at the heart of its statecraft, but it is not an irrational actor. Should we scale up our ambitions in national security, complement our breakout moment in foreign policy, and G20 seem to suggest that, with similar transitions in national security? Should we transform militarily? There is another logic which, which we simply must look to. See, the character and profile of a military tasked to secure a $35 trillion economy, which we should be in, in the range of 2047, 2050, has to be very different from that required to secure a $3 trillion economy, which we are. So even if China is not the threat, our character and profile simply has to change. So national security transitions and military transformations. Should we do all of this, if we strengthen our deterrence in meaningful ways, China will back off. 
we shall avert the possible uh, possibility of a high intensity conflict which is definitely not in our self interest some of my learned friends argue that deterrence is costly ladies and gentlemen may i suggest that wars are costlier ask the valiant ukrainians thank you for a very patient hearing jai hind if there are any questions observations any suggestions anything that anybody wishes to say